so how many of you are space geeks? Anybody? I see lots of hands. Yeah, I was, I was, I never actually intended to get into the space industry. The only thing I ever knew I wanted to do in life was race cars. But then in college, I got into it. And uh, it was because of all the inspiring things that I saw when I was a kid, like go, people going to the moon. I sat on my grandfather's lap when, uh, when I watched the first man step on the moon. And uh, because of happenstance in college, I ended up going to the space industry. And I watched over the years as things degraded and we weren't doing as much and I left it about 10 years ago. I went back into automotive, but guess what? Uh, things have changed and uh, I'm back because things are different now. And it's different because of entrepreneurs like you and it's different because of the new thinking and the new generation of people that are getting involved with it and the kind of money that's coming into it. So I like to say that a new space race is here and uh, we're, we're at Vector, is a company I formed a couple of years ago to start participating in, in what I think is a, is a massive revolution in space. So what we're, uh, what we're really fueled by is something that I call the microsatellite disruption. So it used to be in the old days, when I first started in the business, the satellites were the size of a car or, and they uh, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, took years to build. In your career, you could hope to build maybe one or two, and if you had a failure, it was a dismal part of your career. Now, satellites are something you can hold in the size of your hand, and they might cost tens of thousands of dollars and could be developed in months. So that's fundamentally changed the dynamics of the space industry. It's drawn in investor dollars who are willing to take risks on, on new ideas that people have, and it's drawn in a whole new generation of people. So it's made, really, the space race come true. The problem is, though, that how to get those satellites into orbit is really a problem right now. Uh, the existing options are dismal. What, what people who build these microsatellites are reduced to is putting them essentially in the trunk of a car, in other words, on a big rocket, and launching along with a whole bunch of other satellites. If you could imagine sharing your house with 10 other families, that's kind of the equivalent of what happens. So at Vector, what we set out to do is to lower the barriers to space access so that people like yourselves can, can get both your hardware up there and eventually get your ideas up there. We have a two-part business strategy to start with a high launch rate using very, very small launch vehicles. And then eventually we're building a, a constellation of software-defined satellites that you can program like you would a cell phone with apps. And that, that instead of having to go through all the trouble of building the, the satellite and launching it, You'll just have to get on your terminal and uh, program it, and you can get access to it. So let's think of it as an applications cloud in space. And what happens is uh, if you reduce the size of a rocket from a, a really large scale to a really small scale, you get a huge reduction in costs. And so on the, on the left, you can see our little Vector H and Vector R that we're building compared to the rockets that went to the moon. And, and you can see what some of Jeff Bezos is building there. The thing that happens is, is we reduce the, the cost by orders of magnitude. So we've gone from about a billion and a half dollars a launch for some of the moon rockets down to about one and a half million for our rockets. So it's, it's a fundamental change of the way we can access space once we do these sort of things. To do this, we've got two launch vehicles. We have what we call the, the Vector R for rapid and uh, the Vector H for heavy. That's a tongue in cheek. Uh, everybody's got to have a heavy rocket. So these are about 11, 12 meters tall. They're very small rockets. Uh, but the key is that they can launch microsatellites and they're, they're built to address that market. So the, the thing that's very different about these rockets is we're going to build them in large numbers. I mentioned that I, I went into automotive for about a decade. And what we're doing is we're bringing that, that technology and that, and that basic uh, industrial capability to rockets. You know, so, Somebody else very famous said recently, he's taking rocket, or rocket technology to cars. We're doing the opposite to mass produce these rockets. So this has never been done before, and we'll be producing and flying these rockets by hundreds. What that allows us to do is make the rockets cheaper, and we actually make more profit. So everybody wins on this, and there's nothing new you have to invent here. In 1923, Henry Ford made the Model T just like this. So we like to think of this as the Model T of rockets. And what this also allows us to do is, is what I call making rockets like sausages. We can franchise out this manufacturing to places all over the United States and eventually all over the world. 
so we can have assembly plants closer to where the customers are. And that's exactly our plan, is to start in the United States and eventually franchise some of these manufacturing operations to places like Europe. So you, you, we really don't have to invent anything new. Uh, if you look at how rockets are made today, SpaceX, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the, with the Falcon, marvelous vehicle, but they're only made by the tens a year. And the reason that they're reusable is so that they can get the flight rates up because they can't produce enough of them in their factory. They, they don't have enough people and the factory's not big enough. They sort of cap out at about 10 a year. So if you reuse the first stage, that gets your flight rates up to about 20 a year. We're talking about emulating so the modern automotive manufacturing techniques to get our launch rates up into the hundreds a year. So this is a little bit like the transition, for example, of Maserati in the 60s. They were hand-built where Luigi would take uh, and, and take the parts to the vehicle, and it was one person, one vehicle. And uh, now in modern days, if you go through some of those factories, they're on a, on a, on a moving machine, and the, and the vehicles are assembled uh, uh, in, in an assembly line kind of way. So what this will do, if we can accomplish hundreds of years, is it creates a transportation model that's different than it's been. At 10 or 20 a year, anybody that flies satellites will tell you that's one of their biggest risks, is getting a ride to space. But if, if you had to do the same thing with flying on airplanes, you wouldn't go very far. I wouldn't be here in Finland. So what we're trying to do is develop a transportation model that's a much more reliable schedule, a reliable cost that, that the entrepreneurs can count on, that they know that will be there in the years ahead and the decades ahead to be able to put their assets in space. And so we, uh, in, in the two years since we've been in business, uh, we, we start off by purchasing a company that had been doing this for a while. And uh, we, uh, we, we've been making a lot of progress. In fact, I think we've made more rapid progress than anybody else in the industry, if you, if you plot it out. This is our first flight, which we did in the desert of a full-scale Vector R in, in May. And uh, just for fun, we parked a drone over the top of it. Oh, sorry. I'll go back to that one. Let's see if it goes. We, we parked a drone over, over this. Ah, it's not working. Forget it. So yeah, that's the second flight that we did in, uh, in Camden, uh, Georgia. You can see it. Uh, there you go. Everybody's got to have a little bit of rocket noise there. So we flew this uh, to a suborbital altitude and recovered it out of the jungle. It was uh, proof that our systems could work and that uh, we, we had a, uh, a gradual uh, incremental development approach. So uh, we've, we've continued to, to build these vehicles. Our first flights uh, to orbit are gonna be this July coming up. And uh, this is at Wald Flight Facility where our first flights will be in Virginia. Right now they're sending uh, payloads to both to the moon and the space station from here. And uh, we'll be joining the ranks of people that fly out of there. We're gonna launch uh, in a lot of different places in the US, uh, out of Alaska, out of Florida, out of Wallops, and probably out of California. Eventually, we might even be launching off of barges. This is, this is essentially key to us being able to launch hundreds of years, to have multiple launch sites. And when we go there, we don't have an infrastructure we have to drag behind us. We go there, we set up on a concrete pad, as you can see in the desert. Uh, we did it from a dirt, dirt pad, that worked out very well. We're building a factory in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we just awarded a contract this last week to a, to a contractor, and this will be uh, a factory that's capable of building hundreds of these a year. Uh, we'll break ground very soon and, and have that up and running uh, by uh, early uh, 20, uh, 2018, 2019. So what we're looking at then, uh, if we can accomplish this, is transforming today what is a very hardware-centric, expensive, uh, uh, industry into something that's software centric. If you look around here at, at Slush, what you see is an innovation that's based a lot on software. And so a lot of, a lot of you who are sitting in the audience and a lot of people here at Slush uh, understand how to make software and understand how to be innovative with it. That's really what we have to do to the space industry to make it more innovative, to bring it to more people is, is to do that. And uh, between our launch vehicles and our Galactic Sky Constellation, we uh, believe that we can, we can make that happen. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you.